What can we do after Trump? Well, let's hope we get to an after Trump, but let's also find out. We're gonna bring on Anthony Barnett here. He is the founder of Open Democracy and the author of Taking Control, Humanity in America After Trump and the Pandemic. Um, Anthony, welcome, and my first question to you is, are we after Trump? Welcome, uh, James, very great to be on. Uh, we're not after Trump yet, n not at all. Uh, and one of the arguments in the book is that what we face with the possible return of Trump uh, is for the first time in my lifetime, the return of what I call modern fascism. I think the Trump is, represents a, a genuine, a different kind of threat after the January 6th. And we're in a very bad position at the moment. When I when the book came out uh, at the beginning of this year, and it, 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 what I argue in it is that at that point, Biden was either going to be a transformational president or a transitional one. And it's clear now the verdict is in. He's going to be transitional. And progressives have had a mighty setback over the last few months with, uh, uh, you know, lost voting, uh, voting rights, um, build back better. The environmental program, uh, it's in a very, very dangerous position. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, and the, I know that you've talked to um, prominent progressives in America, and you know, you're know you from the UK. So I'm curious, not what your take is on the right wing. Uh, number one, anyone who doesn't live inside the bubble of America realizes the right wing in America is lunatics, other than, unless they're also fascist wannabes like Victor Orban in, in Hungary or Bolsonaro in Brazil, etc. Um, I'm curious what your take on Democrats are, uh, whether it's the Democratic leadership like Biden or progressives. No, well, I, I think this is a, a really important issue. Uh, first, I think that the right are not just lunatics. I think there's quite a serious project about imposing minoritarian rule. And if Trump gets control of the surveillance state, we're in for what I mean by modern fascism, and we're in a threat or quite articulated uh, authoritarian rule, which would be very difficult to reverse. So there's a real threat to democracy. And the question of what, what is going to be the future of the left? One of the questions I asked in this book, people have said to me, I'm an optimist, but I'm saying, look, it's 50-50 at the moment. In the United States in the 2020 election, Biden got a 7 million plurality, an 8 million, an absolutely astounding number of people voted for him. And when they said the election was stolen, they don't, you know, the right doesn't really think that that wasn't the case. What they're saying is the people shouldn't have really been voting for him. They don't accept that those people who are voting were really Americans. That's the danger. And I think on our side, we've got to look at what are our strengths? How come, given the defeat of socialism, given the defeat of left, given the last 40 years of the dominance of the market, how come we are as at least equal uh, I say we in terms of progressive forces, because what's happening in America is going to affect everybody around the world. We're equal to the right, even though they have a rigged system. Where do those strengths come from? And I don't think they come from the traditional political top. They come from feminism. They come from Black Lives Matter, from anti-racism. They come from the whole human rights movement, which is not rooted in market values. They come from environmental consciousness and the sense that, you know, we can see how everything fits together, how the systems, are, the factors are interlocking. They come from the developments of modern science and our sense of our body and ourselves. And so there's within, under the last 40 years of the market forces, which produced the classic figures now run the Democratic Party, the Biden generation, the Clintons, the Obamas, underneath this, there were forces opposing marketization. And what we lack is a politics. And my argument here is that what is needed is to combine the need for democracy with the need for welfare and classic economic reforms. And the reason we need this is that one of the things that Trump did was he made voting count. People on the Trump side, why is Trumpism so popular? It's partly because people, his supporters feel empowered by him. And what I think is lacking on the progressive and democratic left is a politics of empowerment. 
that will actually rally people to support. And that, that is still the old tradition of the patronizing welfare tradition, social democratic tradition, which is a broken one. Right. Well, Anthony, I, the Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden are about as inspiring as a wet noodle. So that's not surprising that uh, Democrats have issues here with leadership like that. Um, but have you seen anyone on the progressive side that you think, oh, I, I could see how they might inspire some people and, and create maybe a renaissance within the Democratic Party? Well, I think that there's the millennial generation, AOC, I think is very inspiring, but she also is a very polarizing figure at the moment. And the way that the media introduce her is outrageous. She has, she's got an instinctive and a brilliant capacity to fight back. And I actually find Bernie Sanders a, a very inspiring and articulate figure, but of course, he isn't now of a generation that can really stand for the presidency. And I made this very short film in Washington in March and April of this year. And I was very struck, I was talking to Pramila Jayapal. Now she can't run as president, but she's the head of the, the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And she struck me as an admirably intelligent, articulate, political person, the kind we don't yet have here in, in, in the UK, and we have very few of them in Europe, some in the Green Party in Germany, able to link to politics and to organizers outside as well as inside. I talked to Representative Jamie Ruskin, uh, who led the impeachment process of, of uh, uh, Donald Trump. And he was clearly reaching out. He's what you would call, I think what he calls the moral center. He's reaching out to people. He's not simply standing there saying sort of self-righteously, I'm a leftist, which is the kind of cartoon idea of progressives. He's very serious about what he calls the tightrope of trying to save the American system, to save what voting there is, to save the democracy that you have, and at the same time to expand it so that it represents a, a, a true majority of people across the United States, including people in Washington DC, Puerto Rico, you know, who are not even allowed to vote for the president. And I also talked to Representative Ro Kahana, uh, who is, you know, his his uh, uh, district is from the represents Silicon Valley, and and he has a quite articulate and and careful strategic vision. It struck me. Uh, what he calls progressive capitalism, very very strong on welfare very strong on giving people free university education, very strong also on, on, on enhancing people's capacities with respect to the marketplace. And all of them, what I was very struck by was they were very intelligent, very thoughtful and reaching out to create a much larger alliance. And if that, if that, that is reproduced across the United States and across the Democratic Party, then it certainly has a future if it can reshape itself for the battle of 2024. So, um, I'm curious about the difference between the UK and US. Because it, I think that there are two uh, forces that have destroyed democracy in America. Um, and one is bribery, we allow bribery in America. They're called campaign contributions and they're unlimited. Uh, so Sheldon Adelson, uh, uh, Casino magnet gave Donald Trump over a hundred million dollars two different times, just buying it. He helped to Israel purchase the move of their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He ended the union rights within the casinos. He ended internet gambling so that more people would be forced into his casinos. We just we have an open auction here in America, and then our media is completely corporate owned, corporate controlled, nothing but corporate message. So that's why you'll hear nonstop that bipartisan compromise where the Chamber of Commerce is made happy by corporate Republicans and corporate Democrats is wonderful. And any challenge to that is outrageous radicalism that cannot be tolerated. So that's America, I know America. Um, how does the UK compare to that? Is, is part of the reason the UK, in my opinion, is better off? I mean, it doesn't get more right wing and ridiculous as we are today. Um, is that because you guys don't allow bribery? Yeah, you have some media that isn't completely, uh, you know, toxic. Uh, I'm curious. I don't know. 
Well, the, 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 uh, I don't think, well, first of all, let me just challenge somewhat your description of the United States. I completely agree about the role of money and how outrageous it is. But it's also very unpopular, including among Republicans. So there's something really deeply at fault with your democratic system that allows that. And it's not completely true that your media is totally corporate owned. I don't think the New York Times is utterly corporate in its values. Fox may be the dominant, many dominant of the television, uh, uh, TYT isn't. You have got a much more active, uh, independent online media than we have in the United, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I speak of somebody who founded Open Democracy and we're trying, we're, we're, we're struggling to get one, but we don't have the kind of professionalism and funding yet uh, equal to the progressive media in the United States. Secondly, I think here, um, there are two different things which, which are different. One is Brexit. Now, Brexit is our equivalent of Trump and Brexit was bought. And millions and millions of, uh, of pounds were poured into Brexit from very dubious sources, which we still haven't traced. So there is definitely is a, a role of corruption in the United Kingdom. It's not as grotesque by any means as what you have in the United States. Uh, um, but it, it, it's, it's certainly very influential. And to give you one example, the, the, uh, uh, the, the current Tory government, okay, it's got rid of Boris Johnson. Um, but Boris Johnson was a kind of amateur. He was a clown compared to somebody like Trump. And at the same time, they passed legislation which was uniform across the United Kingdom, imposing ID cards on voting, which is straight out of the American playbook of voter suppression. And that also, uh, uh, Johnson was notorious for taking Russian money. And there's a great deal of high finance corruption of the Conservative Party. And the media here, uh, although we do have The Guardian, which is independent, it's very small, its circulation is about 150,000. It has a very good international website, but it's quite marginal. Whereas the, the big media, the big newspapers, you have Murdoch who made his first fortune here, the Sun, he owns a ton, the Times, the Daily Mail, which is a rancorous right wing daily, the Telegraph, which is owned by uh, from a tax havens, uh, by 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 twin the Barclay brothers, of whose money was uh, you know uh, comes from very dubious origins. So I think that the that sense of you've got a a, a pro market anti government system outside of politics trying to crush our democratic politics. This is, I'm afraid, is true here as well as in the United States. Well, you know, you give me a tiny bit of hope there, Anthony. We're massively out of time, but um, but I I like hearing that our independent media is stronger. Uh, it makes you know it gives us at least something to hang our hat on, uh, and uh, and that's true. I mean, TYT itself is one of the, the largest is, media uh, companies. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. The, the thing that is really important to remember is that there is a progressive majority. It's not a far left majority, which is what the kind of the right we need to say, but there is a progressive majority. And this doesn't have proper political expression. And one of the things that we need to do, I say we in terms of those of us who are creating independent media and having arguments and discussions like this, is to work out how we get the messages across which will mobilize people to vote and also shift the thinking and the understanding and the capacities of those who are elected. Yep, uh, and I also got something else out of this interview, the uh, word rancorous, which I rather enjoyed. Okay, so the uh, book is called Taking Control, Humanity in America After Trump and the Pandemic. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate it. Very good to talk with you, take care. YouTube. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.